You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Hey, Foundry Church, uh, welcome today. As we get into the Word of God, um, I think we should probably at least address that there's something going on on this side of my face. Um, Justin, I was just walking through the office, he hit me with a guitar. I don't know what's going on. The board's punishing him accordingly. You just don't attack people without warning them. So you should probably pray for Justin. He's in a lot of trouble. (laughs) None of that's true. My doctor attacked me uh, and dealt with some things in this region of my head. But that's not why you're here. That's not why we're here to talk. So um, so let's. there's the elephant in the room. We'll set his big pink carcass down, and now we'll talk about uh, the Word of God. So here's, here's what I want to do. We've moved forward from the three-year series, and we're stepping into what's next. Um, do you remember with me before the days of binge-watching, because binge-watching is a pretty new thing ever since content got moved online. Like, there was no binge-watching when we were little, unless you're watching, like, I Dream of Genie reruns on TBS. But um, there was no binge-watching. But there were cliffhangers. Remember cliffhangers? So you're going to do me a favor here. I'm going to play this into my mic. I know it's probably not how sound people would do it, Kyle, but you're not judging me today because I have a wounded face. Um, so I'm going to play a song. If you know the theme song I'm playing, raise your hand. You ready? Yes. It's Dallas. Oh, good job. Oh, oh when I smile, I look like an old sailor. Like, All right, good job. All right, sorry. <laughs> That's how I feel. Yeah, it's Dallas. Um, th- so there was this TV show called Dallas. It was amazing. There was a time in the 80s where there were these horrible, like, nighttime soap operas. There was Dallas, Falcon Crest. There was another one that was pretty powerful. Um, and I remember one of the lady actresses from when I was little, I was like, she is super pretty. But um, but uh, so there was these shows. But anyways, Dallas was this, uh, this kind of TV uh, kind of drama thing going on. And there was this guy named J.R. Ewing. And he was this horrible Texas oil man. Um, and he was just a villain of, this, of the Ewing family. And one year, there was a cliffhanger. And this is why it's important, before the days of binge watching, when there's a cliffhanger and you can just move to the next episode, what happened was uh, JR's in his chair, he turns around and somebody shoots him. Remember? Remember the line, who shot JR? In 1980, there were like people wearing TV sh- or t- uh, t-shirts saying like, I shot JR. Who shot JR? Remember that? Yeah, it was awesome. It was the 80s. Oh, it was so fun. We had a Cold War going. It was super great times in America. And um, we had this, this idea of like, who shot JR? And there was a cliffhanger, and you had to wait till the next season came out, the next episode. And when it said like, to be continued, when in my childhood, we were like, no. Because that truly meant at some point they would continue, but there was no guarantee when. It was brutal. Here's what we know. In the gospel according to Luke, Luke the physician writes this this account of the life of Jesus Christ. His his three years, six days, 15 hours, and one morning. But there's this dot, dot, dot at the end of it. There's this to be continued in the gospel of Luke. And we know that the the follow-up episode is the book of Acts. The, the author, Luke, writes a second book, the book of Acts, and what it is is it's really the addendum of, of what happened to the life and ministry of Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, we see the kind of tail end of Jesus' earthly ministry after his life, death, and resurrection. Then we see his ascension in Acts chapter 1, and we see him talking to the disciples, and they're like, and I still love that they, they get it wrong. Even post-Easter, they get it wrong. They say to Jesus, are you now going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And, and we don't see Jesus kind of hang his head and be frustrated. He just says, just wait. Just wait. The, God, the Lord is going to send to you the Holy Spirit. He's going to send to you the Holy Spirit. 
And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we kind of have the the verse in Acts that is, if there's a title verse or a verse that tells you everything that is kind of the battery pack, the energy behind the book of Acts is in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and it says this. It is not for you to know the times or dates of the Father that he has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Jesus makes this claim in Acts chapter 1 that what's about to happen is going to empower you so that your eyes aren't just on Jerusalem and the restoration of the kingdom. They're not just on Judea. They're not just on Samaria. They're they're to the ends of the earth. You're going to see God's kingdom bigger when God fills you with his Holy Spirit. And today we want to take some time and look at it because the disciples would have been 40 days encountering the risen Lord at different times during these 40 days Jesus came to to the disciples and he encountered them. He encountered them, he taught them, he walked with them, he ate with them, he restored them like Peter was restored. And we look at it and we understand that what was going on in Acts chapter 1 up to Acts chapter 2 is really Jesus' final days on earth before he ascended. And when he ascended in Acts chapter 1, he, he's standing among them, they're looking at him, he goes up in a cloud. He ascends back to the Father. He didn't die again. He ascended back. And two angels said, why are you staring at the sky? This Jesus will come back to you in the way he left. He will come back to you in the clouds. He will come back down. So the the promise of Christ's return was given to us right there. So the disciples, this had been 40 days. The disciples then go and they wait for the word of Jesus Christ to be fulfilled. Remember on Easter we talked, the word of Jesus became much more, um, they, they gave it more weight because they realized everything he said about himself was true. And now when Jesus says, wait for the Holy Spirit to be given to you, they go and they obey. They wait. They wait in an upper room. And it says this, that on the day of Pentecost, they had gathered. Now, Pentecost is a Christian holiday, but in the Hebrew tradition, it would have been the festival of weeks. And we're not going to go into all that, even though I want to, because it's kind of awesome. But we're not going to dive into all that. What we're going to do is know that God had already gathered a number of faithful Jewish people in and around Jerusalem for one of the pilgrim annual feasts, where all the men of Jerusalem made sure they came back for these feasts. And what we see in this is the Holy Spirit comes in power into the church, but the disciples would have been 10 days waiting. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't feel like we're good at waiting anymore, right? This would have been a little bit of um, a commercial break in the the kind of binge watching of the Gospels. This would be a long pause where you're like, oh, come on, get back to the story. Because they're just waiting and they're praying, but they're doing so with this expectancy, I don't know if you've ever waited expectantly. Like, you know, you go to Giordano's, is that the name of it, the pizza place? What's the name? Yeah, over on the north side of Holland where they do the the Chicago-style pizza that takes 11 days to cook. Like, if you've ever gone there, you're like, I'll have a pizza. And they're like, that's fine. You'll have Social Security when it gets here. It's it's devastating how long these pizzas take, right? Because we're in an instant culture where we want it right away. The idea of you and I parking in an upper room somewhere and waiting for 10 days, I just don't think it's likely to happen. I I don't think we're good. If we're in traffic for too long, we're just in the foulest of moods, right? You're like, I don't know what's going on in State Street in Zealand, but that is unacceptable. We do not wait well. They waited 10 days for Jesus. And you know in that time they were remembering his words. They were studying the scriptures. They would have been engaged in remembering what was going on, exploring maybe what does this promise look like? What's it gonna be like when the Holy Spirit comes? And finally, The day comes where on the day of Pentecost, Christ sends the Spirit. And it says this, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. 
Now, there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together and they were bewildered because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? So I'm guessing they had some sort of accent, you know? Like, you know, to us, Mater has that little southern accent from cars, you know? And he's like, you, and he has that southern accent. We'd be like, you know, for us, we'd be like, aren't those people all from Georgia? Why are they, why are they speaking fluently these other languages? So they say, aren't, they, aren't these people speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our native tongue. The God is speaking to them in their tongue through these Galileans. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? But some of the people made fun of them, and they said they have had too much wine. It's 9 a.m., you know, they're drunk, which I think, wow, do, do you normally start that early in the day? Like, that seems to me like this, what? Like, what? That's their response to this miraculous intervention of God speaking to them in a language they will understand. And um, we know this, most of them would have already spoken Greek. So God was speaking a specific word into their culture, into their context. He was using them to do this transforming work. But what I love in this is we get to see one of the most startling transformations in all of Scripture, and it takes place in the person of Peter. We remember with me, Peter is the one who denied Christ three times the night he was betrayed, and he left and ran away from Christ, weeping bitterly, went back to his former life. And Jesus went and found Peter on the seashore after he resurrected and called him back and restored him. He restored Peter to ministry, saying, feed my sheep, take care of my people. This transformation, how did it happen? Well, I think two things. Peter had to deal with what he did wrong. Then he had to deal with it in front of Jesus, and Jesus redeemed what was lost. And in that, we take a great, a great deal of hope. But then there's this moment of waiting, this patience that Peter displays in waiting for Christ to send the Holy Spirit so that everything he does becomes this spirit-filled, winsome, wonderful response to God. It's God living inside of him, speaking to and through him. Jesus Jesus sends the Spirit, and Peter becomes this man, not by his own power, but by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit living in him. He goes from this man who denied Christ three times at at the house of the high priest during the trial, he's in that courtyard, he denies him, to this guy who stands up at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem during a pilgrim festival feast, he stands up and addresses a crowd of thousands. And he says to them, his first words are this. Um, he said, uh, men of Jerusalem, fellow Jew- Jews and residents of Jerusalem. He wants all of their attention. Instead of saying, no, I don't know the man, leave me alone. Now he's saying, I know the man and I know his mission. Everybody look at me, I have something worth saying. And the end of his, um, his teaching on that day is phenomenal. It says this in uh, Acts 2, 36, after Peter had laid out the case for Christ. He says this, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has has made this Jesus who you crucified. It had to be the most unpopular, uncomfortable moment in Jerusalem when they're like, oh, that's right. You know, like he reminds them he's not there to win friends. He's there to lead people to Jesus. And he says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus who you crucified both Lord and Messiah. 
and he makes this claim and he stakes it in the ground and he has this transformed moment. And here's the thing. Peter is not a well-educated man. Yes, he spent three years with Jesus, but he had no real formal education. He was a fisherman. He was a common everyday guy. And so when we look at ministry, the, the greatest pastor of them all, Peter, all he did was spend time with Jesus. And he was still really kind of struggling with what to do. But when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, everything changed. Everything changed. And the transformation in Peter is this eye-popping moment, <laughs> no pun intended, but um, but. This eye-popping moment who you had to be like, is that really the guy who denied him? What's the difference? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminating within you, within me, within Peter, the truths of God and teaching us what to say. The Spirit of God giving him the words and speaking through him. The Spirit of God giving you the words, giving me the words to speak his truth, to reach people to tell them about the love of God that is there for them in Christ Jesus and to make no bones about the fact of the way this works. It is about confession, repentance, and following Christ closely in mission. We follow him closely, and he promised that he would send his Holy Spirit to fill us and enliven us, and that's what we see in Peter. That's what we see in Peter. We see this man who had denied Christ is now proclaiming him and he's doing it in a very effective way because 3,000 people come to know Jesus, which just is like mind-boggling to me. Like, what do you do with 3,000 new believers? What do you do? How do you create a system for that? Like, I, last week after Easter, I was kind of like, oh, Wow. There's a lot of people in the foundry. Like we all came together in three services at, at the auditorium. I was like, wow, there's a lot of us in this church. And we're nowhere, I mean, we're, we're not, we're not 3,000 people. And this is one day. All they had was an upper room. You can't put that many people in that room. How does Peter and what do you how does Peter handle and what do you do with 3,000 believers? And I believe this next series is going to lean in for us what we want to do in response to the growth here because it's what they did with the growth there. It's what Peter and the disciples did with such an influx of people. 3,000 people accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they were faithful Jews from all over the world, which means what? God was preparing to send the gospel home. He was gonna send it to all the known world at that time. He did this during a pilgrim feast when people would have come to Jerusalem for a temporary stay. He gave them what they needed and he sent them home. So the, the, the apostles did this thing that we're gonna lean into. It's kind of the, the, the turning point for the entire understanding of how we disciple and how we do community and life and different things together. It, it tells us there is a, a standard or a way in which we approach this life. It says this in Acts 2, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Four things. Four things, and you would think th there's not that much to it, but let's just read through. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They held everything in common. They sold property, possessions, and everything to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Now when we talk about the apostolic teaching, we need to know these are the men who walked with Jesus. They were teaching what Jesus had said to them. They were reminded and remembering and then communicating out what Jesus had said. 
they were devoting themselves to the words of Christ, excuse me, as it was remembered and walked through by the disciples, John, Peter, Matthias, all these different men. The teaching would have been right there, but then there's this fellowship. We have terrible words in the church. Like, I think if you're an unchurched person and you come in and you're like, you know, would you like to have some fellowship? You're like, I guess I like boating. What is a fellowship? Like, is it like the love boat? I don't get it. It's 80s TV day. Um, So, you know, you don't understand, but fellowship is really just this depth of relationships, this depth of understanding and relationships. They devoted themselves to the words of Jesus Christ, to knowing and being in deep relationship, to the breaking of bread, which is so fascinating because this festival, the festival of Pentecost, was the Feast of Weeks in the Old Testament. And the Feast of Weeks is when they took two leavened loaves, two loaves of bread, and it would have been a wave offering, and they would have broken it and eaten it among one another. They would have remembered the breaking of the bread. It just blows my mind how God put all this together. He puts it all together to make sense. The Festival of Weeks becomes Pentecost, which is really nothing new. It's the fellowship the deepening of relationships, the breaking of bread, the coming of the Holy Spirit that enlivens what? The final kind of act of what they did, prayer. They devoted themselves to prayer. Notice in here, there's nothing about missions. There's nothing about like committees. They devoted themselves to the teaching, to relationship, to breaking bread, and to prayer. And the church grew every day. Every single day the church grew. And we're going to dig into this over the next four weeks, looking at each one of these elements, and ask ourselves, ourselves, how are we living into this? How are we living in to what the apostles and the early church did? This is a short series that will show us that really, in the end, it's up to one thing. It comes down to, it boils itself down to one thing. Are we living lives that are spirit-filled, obedient, courageous lives? Or are we serving ourselves with some Christian language around it? And a lot of us will come to the realization we serve ourselves in most times. And that's where we have to have a Peter moment. Will we stop and turn towards him? Or will we choose to serve ourselves and treat Christianity as a side trinket to our life, not the centerpiece. For you and I, we have to understand the coming of the Holy Spirit changed everything. These men knew Jesus for three years and had utterly failed him. Jesus restored them, but he said, don't go out. Don't go do anything until I send you the thing that changes it. It's like gasoline in the motor, right? You can have a perfectly good motor, but without the fuel to run it, It's not good for much. It's just a great boat anchor, right? But when you do this, when you look at our faith with the the Holy Spirit, you can know everything about God and be completely useless in the Christian faith. I actually know a number of people who have that, just the smartest people in the world, and no spiritual tenderness, no love for mission. They may have some pet projects, but they don't have this spiritual winsomeness. And one of the things I've learned about the Holy Spirit is it'll say things like Peter did, let all Israel be assured that this God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. That is a brutal line, letting people know exactly what they've done. But there's still this, like, there's this brute honesty, but there's this winsome joyfulness that says, not only do we know exactly how bad we are, we know exactly how good he is. And he's calling us to himself. And we get to live in the joyful anticipation that the Spirit of God is transforming us. The Holy Spirit of God, we ask him to fill us daily. I'll be honest, I ask the Spirit of God to fill me multiple times a day, every day. Because I just get tired of certain things, maybe like you do. I get tired of certain aspects of life. I'm like, God, could you fill me with your Spirit? Because I just don't see it. And I'm really irritated. I'm really frustrated. And it's not just with like church. It's about everything. Everything. Satan tries to get into my life and turn my witness away from him. And I ask God to fill me with his Holy Spirit time and again. And what I found is this. There is no religious effort I can make to be a better person. That does me nothing. But I can submit to being filled with the Holy Spirit 
and then submit to when he convicts me of something. When the Spirit of God invites me to obey, when the Spirit of God calls me to, um, to a repentance or something, I obey. I obey. And what's amazing is people see our brokenness in such more beautiful light than they do our greatness. Things I do well, I think, boy, I think people like that. Nobody really likes it, and it drives me nuts. But what people do enjoy is the brokenness that you can own, and you can say, this is who I was, but this is what God called me out of. People enjoy seeing that you're not a religious relic. You're not something kept in a museum. You're a vibrant representation of the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. My invitation to you today is this, to be people who know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is literally enlivened. It is brought to life. It is powered, motivated, moved, and driven forward by the Spirit of God living inside of you. The Spirit of God living inside of you. And I invite you to be Christians who don't just talk about their faith, but they live it out as people filled with the Holy Spirit, obeying what he calls them to do obeying the Holy Spirit when he nudges you. And it will be some of the craziest things ever. Crazy things you'll be invited to do, but the reality is this. When you obey the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God expands. And you cannot deny it. You can't deny that God's at work when the Spirit prompts and the church obeys, the kingdom grows, period, period. So for you and I, the kingdom should be growing in and around our lives. As it said, The Lord added to their numbers daily. How did he do that? By speaking through the Holy Spirit what he wanted the church to do, and then they obeyed. Then they obeyed. I see no reason why the church isn't taking over the world with this winsome, loving, honest call to Christ. Calling all people back to the one who died to save them the way he saved us. And then giving them the Holy Spirit to transform their lives. You can't fix yourself, but the Spirit of God will transform you into the image of him who we love, our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray with me. God, thank you for your Spirit. Thank you for calling us back to yourself. Thank you for not leaving us in our own sin and, um, and brokenness. We just ask that you would come now, Holy Spirit. Fill us, your church. Give us, give us um, a just a filling of your spirit that we could live in your power. God, give us the courage to obey when your spirit speaks a strange and uncomfortable word. God, I think of how uncomfortable it must have been when you prompted Peter to stand and open his mouth and call all the attention of the Temple Mount to himself. But Lord, his obedience saw 3,000 people follow you and then go home to all regions of the Roman Empire to share the gospel. Thank you, God, for starting the church by the power of your Holy Spirit through the blood of Christ for the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.